Welcome to your lecture on the biological basis of behavior, starting with the nervous system and the endocrine system. This lecture will focus on the structure of the neuron, the central nervous system, the peripheral nervous system, neurotransmitters, and neural firing. When discussing the nervous system, it's important to note that there are two divisions, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. The nervous system will include the brain, the spinal cord, and all associated nerves. The two major divisions, the central nervous system, consists of the brain and the spinal cord, while the peripheral nervous system will include all other nerves in our body. In this flowchart, you see what is included in both the peripheral and the central nervous system. If you look at the part that is coded green in the diagram, you'll notice that the central nervous system is the brain and the spinal cord. If you're looking at the red, it is all of the other nerves. Your peripheral nervous system actually divides into two subsystems, one called the autonomic and one called the somatic. In your autonomic system, it'll actually control for the reactions of your internal organs, your heart, your lungs, even your eyes, and your glands, say your adrenal glands, um, or any of the other glands that may produce testosterone, but it is going to be essentially your fight or flight mechanism. Your autonomic will actually divide into two different areas, one called the sympathetic or the arousing, and one called the parasympathetic or calming. Your somatic division actually deals with voluntary movement and reflex movement. This includes both your sensory nerves that bring information to the brain and the spinal cord, and your motor nerves that take commands away from the brain and the spinal cord. When we talk about the divisions of the peripheral nervous system, we talk about the autonomic system quite a bit because it subdivides into the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. So take a moment and imagine you are pushed out of a plane. How would you react? Well, if you're sympathizing with that person being pushed out of a plane, you might go into a fight or flight response. In other words, your heart might start to beat rapidly. Your breathing might increase your eyes may go very, very wide with your pupils dilating. All sorts of things may start to change within your body as you deal with this either fight or flight response. With your parasympathetic, I try to get students to remember, think of a parachute. Once you've been pushed out of that plane, you realize you have your parachute on. And as you pull the ripcord, your heart starts to calm down. Your vision starts to go back to normal. Your breathing starts to calm down. And while you may still feel the shakes, the adrenaline that was released from your adrenal glands starts to burn out through your system. In other words, it calms you down. Hopefully, as you're watching this video, you realize that you should be in a parasympathetic state. You shouldn't be freaked out. You shouldn't be wanting to run or fight. However, if you're driving a car and you almost hit a deer, you will feel fight or flight. Again, that system will kick on. And once you realize that you're safe and everything is okay, your system will calm down. With the sympathetic and the parasympathetic, it's important to note that the sympathetic division is meant to get you ready to protect yourself or to flee from danger. Your parasympathetic is what kicks on when you realize you are now okay. If you notice, all of the nerves that are coming from the spinal cord are going to organs or they're going to glands. So remember, the autonomic system that works automatically deals with organs and glands. When we talk about the somatic, we're talking about skeletal movement and voluntary ability. When we talk about the autonomic, we're really talking about fight or flight, but again, remember organs and glands. What would happen if you were in your kitchen and you didn't realize someone had just used the stove? You put your hand on a burner, what would you do? We're gonna talk about something called your reflex arc. This is going to include your somatic division of your nervous system. This is a very basic level of neural communication, and it doesn't include the brain, just the spinal column. It occurs in three steps. First, you need to have a signal from the environment, something that your receptor cells can turn into a neural impulse. Here, you see your hand reach out and touch a hot pan or maybe that burner in your kitchen. The message from the heat is going to be processed in cells in your fingertips.
Next, that message is going to go to what we call a sensory nerve. Sensory nerves are part of your peripheral nervous system and they are part of the somatic division. That message of you touching something really hot is gonna travel up that nerve and go to your spinal cord. Here you see the message going from the hand and up the sensory nerves to the spinal cord. Next, cells called interneurons that exist in the brain and the spinal cord are gonna process that information. It is important to note that interneurons are not part of the peripheral system, they're part of the central nervous system because they exist in the brain and the spinal cord. The interneurons will determine how intense that message is. If it is not super intense, it'll send the message to the brain. But in this case, since you're touching something and you're damaging your fingertips, that message is gonna be very intense and the interneuron is going to stimulate a message down a motor nerve to make sure you move your hand as quickly as possible. So your interneurons are going to be that very, very tiny relay neuron that's deep inside the spinal cord. Once processed through the interneuron, a motor neuron is going to be impacted. The motor neuron is gonna take a message and send it to muscle tissue. Those motor neurons are gonna cause your muscles to react and move your hand away from the hot surface. Eventually, the information will still make it to the brain but it might be more important to move first and really feel the pain later. This explains when our reflexes happen, when we pull our hand away from a hot surface and then feel like we feel the pain just a moment later. Here's the entire process. I touch something really, really hot with my hand. A sensory neuron sends the message to my spinal cord. An interneuron determines that the sensation is really intense and I should pull my hand away very quickly. That interneuron sends a message to a motor neuron, which causes my arm to flex and pull my hand away without me consciously thinking about it. At the same time, that interneuron is gonna also send that message to my brain. Now remember, it takes time. This is a pathway. It's not done instantaneously. So this may explain why you experience the physical sensation just a little bit after you actually move your body. Please pause the video at this point just to review how your reflex arc works. We're now gonna talk about the neuron or the nerve cell, a basic building block of the nervous system. This cell performs three tasks. It receives information, it carries a message, and then it passes the message off to another neuron. Often I'll describe neural firing like a game. There are very specific roles. The dendrites can only catch messages, but they have to send them back. The cell body determines whether enough a message should be continued. The axon will generate an electrical signal that allows the ends to actually send new signals. Another way of kind of looking at neural firing is essentially that these are like electrical cords. One side can receive information and the other side can send information. Your dendrites are like the receptor side of an electrical cord where the terminal branches or the ends of the axon are the side that you would plug into maybe an electrical socket. It's important that you know the basic structure of a neuron. So dendrites are going to be the part that looks almost like the top of a tree, very branchy. And they're going to have very specific areas on them that allow them to receive information. That information will be called a neurotransmitter, and it basically acts like a chemical message for the cell. Now, neurotransmitters don't get absorbed. They basically unlock a message and then they go home. So they don't stay with the dendrite. The next structure is the cell body, also called the soma. This contains the nucleus and maintains the health of the neuron, but it also starts to determine whether enough, enough stimulation or enough neurotransmitters have docked at a dendrite to maybe move into what we call the firing stage. The axon is going to be the entire long trunk of that cell. That looks very much like the trunk of a tree. So everything that is covered in blue all the way down to what we see as the terminal endings is the axon. In this structure, you will have an electrical charge, an electrical impulse that we call the action potential. Your neuron deals with electrochemical energy. Chemicals 
impact the dendrite, the electricity runs down the axon, and in the terminal ends, or the axon terminals, more neurotransmitters are housed. The axon terminals, the root part of the tree, are the endpoint of the neuron, and it stores neurotransmitters. Now, if you remember, just a moment ago, I said these are like electrical cords. So imagine that the dendrites are the part that you can plug another electrical cord into. And the terminal endings, well, that's gonna be the part that actually is a plug. Dendrites can receive stimulation, but they don't keep it. And the terminal endings can send stimulation, and they do keep it. So dendrites always release their neurotransmitters and axons or terminal ends or axon terminals always house neurotransmitters. The neurotransmitters do not travel through the cell. The myelin sheath covers the axon. Now I mentioned just briefly before that the axon carries what we call an electrical charge. That electrical charge goes down the axon much faster if it's covered in this fatty tissue. Essentially, it acts like insulation, like maybe the plastic or rubber that you would have around an electrical cord. When we look at neural firing, I often tell people, think about it like dominoes. There are three different stages. First, you have to set up the dominoes. Second, you have to knock a domino over and put it into action. And third, if you wanna do it again, you have to reset the dominoes. Step one, resting potential. At resting potential, there is potential energy in the cell. Nothing has impacted the dendrites, there is no electrical charge in the axon, and the axon terminals have not released any neurotransmitters. The first stage in this is there has to be something that stimulates the dendrite. Once the dendrites get stimulated and there's enough information for the cell to send an electrical charge, it goes into what we call the action potential. And the action potential technically is the name for the neural impulse, the actual electrical charge. That electrical charge travels down the length of the axon and bumps into what we call synaptic vesicles, these balls of neurotransmitters that are housed at the end, and it throws them into the cell wall and it allows neurotransmitters to spill out. Once the neurotransmitters are released into an area called the synapse, they can then bind with another cell. Since we know that those neurotransmitters always go back home, they don't stay at the dendrite end, we have to wait for all of the neurotransmitters to go back into the axon terminals. We have to wait for all the neurotransmitters on the dendrite end to be released. During this time where we're waiting for all of these things to reset, we're waiting for the cell to go back to its factory settings. This is called the refractory period. The cell cannot fire at this time, it is just resetting. So much like if you wanted to knock the dominoes down a second time, you would have to reset up all of those dominoes. The action potential or the electrical charge follows something called the all or none principle. This means that in the axon, when an electrical charge is going to be sent, it either fires completely or not at all. And the intensity is always the same. When we talk about neural firing, the electrical charge follows something called the all or none principle. Think of this kind of like a light switch. It's either on or it's off. The neural firing that electrical charge will fire at the same strength no matter what. If you're playing with a Nerf gun and I told you to pull the trigger back slowly, the bullet wouldn't come out slowly. Or if I told you to pull it back fast, it wouldn't come out faster. That's kind of the idea. A neuron fires at the same intensity every time. When we ask, all right, well then how do I feel things more intensely than others? That's the rate of firing. So if a cell fires at the rate of fire, 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 it might feel like a dull throb, but if the firing is fire, 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 it might feel more intense, like a really strong pain. Regardless of the rate, the firing is the same every single time. Neurons communicate at a small space called a synapse. This is when neurotransmitters can be released from the terminal buttons or the ends of the axon go through this small space and bind at dendrites. Neurotransmitters are chemical messengers. They fit perfectly into these receptor sites on the dendrites like a lock into a key, but like every other key that you've ever used, you never leave them in the lock. So they have to be removed from the dendrites and they go home to where they were sent from, 
which is the terminal buttons or the axon terminals. When a cell is done firing, those neurotransmitters, when they go back to the terminal buttons, it's a process called reuptake. During this time, the cell is resetting. It is in its refractory stage and it cannot fire again. Here, you're looking at an action potential reaching the very end of an axon. This is a terminal button or an axon terminal. Those little balls are what we call vesicles and they contain all of the messengers, the neurotransmitters. When that electrical charge hits those vesicles, it pushes them into a cell wall. That small space between the top object and what we see as the receptor sites of the receiving neuron, that space between them is the synaptic gap or the synapse. Those little circles that you see, those are your neurotransmitters. They will be docked at the receptor site on a dendrite to send a message, but they're gonna go back home to those vesicles. One last time, we'll go through the entire process. Stimulation at a dendrite end causes the cell body to react. It then causes an action potential or an electrical charge that travels down the axon. Once that electrical charge reaches the end of the axon or the axon terminals, the electrical charge or action potential hits those vesicles. The vesicles go into the cell wall and allows new neurotransmitters to spill out into a space between that and a dendrite of another cell called the synapse. Those neurotransmitters dock at new receptor sites, stimulate a new cell, get released, and then through the process of reuptake, go back into their original home. So it's kind of like walking to your neighbor's house to give them a message. You maybe have the key to their house. So you walk over, you open the door, you yell in and tell them something, then you shut the door and you and your key go back home. You don't stay at your neighbor's house. So those neurotransmitters go from axon on one cell to the dendrite on another cell to give it a quick message, and then they go back home. Neurotransmitters have to fit perfectly into the receptor sites on the dendrites. They can excite neural activity or they can inhibit neural activity. Here you see a neurotransmitter fitting perfectly into that receptor site, literally like a lock and a key. The types of neurotransmitters that you need to know for this class are just a few. There's over 100 in the human body, and we need to know about four. The first one is called acetylcholine. This one deals with learning, memory, and muscle contractions. If you have a lack of acetylcholine, you might actually be developing Alzheimer's disease. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter that we actually refer to as our reward pathway neurotransmitter. It helps us with attention and remembering things that we like. If you have too much dopamine, you might have schizophrenia. That causes hallucinations and delusions. Serotonin is our mood neurotransmitter. It does affect hunger, sleep, and overall arousal. And when we say arousal in psychology, we mean like attention and your mood, how happy or how sad you are. Low levels of serotonin are associated with depression. And finally, you need to know about endorphins. These neurotransmitters are responsible for pain relief. So if you've ever stubbed your toe or felt kind of a weird whoosh after you've hurt yourself, that just kind of makes the pain more bearable, those are your endorphins. When we talk about drugs in psychology, we're talking about two classifications, either antagonists or agonists. An antagonist is going to be a drug that actually blocks the receptor sites preventing neurotransmitters from sending their message. If it's an agonist, it's kind of almost like a skeleton key. It's a mimic of a neurotransmitter that is similar enough to do the exact same thing that the neurotransmitter is supposed to do. It's a mimic, it enhances that neural message. Here you see an antagonist. Notice that this drug, again, not a neurotransmitter, but a drug, fits just enough into the receptor site that a neurotransmitter couldn't bind there. So it blocks the neurotransmitter without sending the signal. Here you see an agonist. An agonist looks almost exactly like the neurotransmitter, just one small piece off, and it is similar enough that it's going to act just like the neurotransmitter and help enhance that message. 
Finally, we're gonna talk about something called the endocrine system. We talked about the nervous system, and while the endocrine system isn't part of the nervous system, it is a communication system in the body. This also uses chemical messengers, but they're called hormones, and they take slower to kind of get going and a lot slower to shut down. Think there's a difference between an email that gets sent electronically and then having to send someone an actual letter. The pituitary gland is going to be a gland that is in the brain, so it controls all of the other glands. We often refer to this as the master gland. It's pea-sized and it's located at the base of a structure called the hypothalamus. It can cause other endocrine glands to either release hormones or prevent some from releasing hormones. Again, hormones are those chemical messengers that are produced in your glands. They circulate through your blood system and they can actually lock into receptor sites very much like neurotransmitters. Your thyroid gland in your neck is gonna help regulate energy levels in the body. Your adrenal glands are going to release things like adrenaline when you're stressed out. And we talked about those when we talked about our autonomic system, specifically the sympathetic division. You have sex glands, your ovaries and testes. These release things like testosterone and estrogen. While it's not important that you remember every single one of these, it is important to understand that the glands release another chemical, hormones, that allow your body to communicate. At this point, we've gone through everything that we need to know about the neuron and the endocrine system at this time.